have to go to the next question, Tom Hartman. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So uh, I'm going to be talking about actually a uh, very closely related topic uh, as in Rob's talk, but from a different perspective. And uh, part of what I want to address is the, is the things that came up in the question session, actually. So uh, I hope that people will, uh, I encourage you to interrupt me during the talk, uh, but then we can also come back to these, to these questions at the end if we haven't done so already. Uh, so um, the, the, back, the setting here, the background is uh, similar to Rob's talk. In order to make this self-contained, I'm gonna spend five minutes uh, reviewing the important elements but then we'll we'll move into the to the uh, to the new part, which is the idea that wormholes uh, can be um, used to derive uh, directly to to directly derive um, some of these formulas and to understand them directly from the gravitational path integral. So uh, first, the page curve, and since Rob already showed this, I'll just go quickly. Uh, the uh, important thing about Hawking radiation that I'm going to be relying on is that Hawking radiation is a process of entanglement production between the black hole interior and the radiation. So the, uh, the quantum state of the fields on a full slice, a nice slice that goes into the interior, is pure. So the reason that the Hawking radiation looks thermal is that we have access only to one piece of that slice. And it's by tracing out the interior that it becomes thermal. Um, so we can think about this process as, as a process of uh, creating this entanglement. And the uh, paradox can be phrased in terms of the uh, unreasonably large entanglement between the black hole interior and the radiation. The uh, calculation of the entropy is the entropy just of the radiation we consider the fine-grained von Neumann entropy of this radiation minus trace of rho log rho. It's important that we're talking about the fine-grained entropy, uh, which um, would be zero in a pure state. And in particular, after the radiation, after we've collected all the radiation and the black hole is completely evaporated, uh, in a unitary system, this, this fine-grained entropy should be zero. So this is to be contrasted with the coarse-grained entropy that we talk about in thermodynamics, which only goes up. Uh, the page curve is the plot of the radiation entropy. Hawking's calculation predicts that the entropy is thermal and therefore increases uh, until the black hole is gone and just remains constant. To sharpen this paradox, uh, we can compare that to the area of the black hole, area over four in Planck units, which is decreasing as the black hole evaporates. And uh, the paradox occurs when these two lines cross. Why is that? Well, because this is entropy coming from entanglement. And the, um, if the entropy is coming from entangling the radiation with the black hole, then the most entropy you can possibly create with that entanglement is the uh, total number of states or entropy of the black hole itself, area over four. So as soon as these two lines cross, we have a paradox. And that led, uh, as well as some general arguments about quantum systems, uh, led Don Page to the prediction of the unitary page curve uh, that follows Hawking's calculation at early times, turns over, and comes back down to zero. So Hawking, we should be careful here about uh, what we mean by Hawking's prediction. And I want to um, explain why. So Hawking did this calculation in the low energy effective theory. And that's going to be really the theme of, of my talk is what can we trust? What can we believe? What's an effective theory calculation? And what are we really as assuming here? Okay, so uh, what, what we really mean when we say that Hawking predicted the radiation is thermal uh, is that his calculation showed that the density matrix of the radiation is thermal uh, plus perturbative corrections that can, in principle, be calculated by including loops, more matter, etc. And 
potentially also plus unknown uh, non-perturbative corrections that are suppressed by e to the minus m Planck or e to the minus s, where s is the entropy of the black hole. Now, these non-perturbative corrections are very important to this story because if you have e to the minus s corrections to each matrix element, rho sub r, then these tiny non-perturbative corrections can be big enough to fix the entropy. When you calculate the fine-grained entropy of the radiation, it's this trace rho, rho log rho. So this is a sum over e to the s terms. And if you sum these e to the s terms with e to the minus s corrections, you could have a large effect. Okay, so we've, already, we've always known that there's a loophole in Hawking's calculation, which is that if there are non-perturbative contributions, they could potentially uh, solve the, those, those non-perturbative contributions could potentially solve the paradox. So why then is it a paradox um, if, if it can be corrected by these tiny terms? Uh, and the answer to that is twofold. First of all, uh, there are very general arguments just based on uh, quantum information that local corrections don't, can't solve this problem. Okay, so the perturbative term here can't, can't possibly help. It cannot produce a large change in the, in the entropy. Um, so the corrections have to be non-perturbative. They have to involve large quantum effects coming from fluctuations of the geometry itself. And um, we simply had no idea where those might come from and therefore no mechanism uh, for including such terms and understanding how the information could possibly escape. Now we still don't fully understand this mechanism, uh, but we do now know how to calculate some of these e to the minus s terms. And, and that's the um, calculation I'm gonna describe. So to summarize the new developments, there are e to the minus s corrections to the gravitational path integral that produce large corrections to the entropy. This calculation, this new calculation of the entropy gives a small entropy. It differs at leading order from Hawking's prediction. And this small entropy is consistent with unitary evaporation. The ideas here came from string theory and holographic duality, but nothing in this calculation requires string theory or ADS-CFT. This is gonna be an effective field theory calculation um, that, that uh, really could have been done uh, 40 years ago, I think, um, but really the reason it wasn't done is because it re relies on these insights from holographic entanglement that uh, led people in the right direction. We're gonna be using the Euclidean gravitational path integral. The path integral methods sidestep some of the most difficult aspects of the paradox. Uh, and I'll come back to that at the end, but I wanna stress from the beginning that that means that we're not gonna completely understand this mechanism and that this calculation addresses just one piece of the information puzzle. It doesn't solve the paradox. Okay, so um, the, uh, as I said, the history here comes from holographic entanglement, as Rob described. The, um, the recent developments started with the island formula. Um, and um, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is the derivation of the island formula using a new um, non-perturbative effect in the gravitational path integral called replica wormholes. So uh, I'll just quickly state the island formula since it was already in Rob's talk. Um, the island formula is a formula for the radiation entropy. So we have an evaporating black hole and we wanna calculate the entropy of uh, the Hawking radiation in some region. Uh, this is the island formula. This was a proposal made in these papers, uh, motivated by holographic entanglement entropy. Um, but it was, it was a proposal that uh, gave a reasonable answer uh, and was motivated by holography. And we're gonna come back and derive it later in the talk. Uh, so um, there are two contributions. There's an area gravitational contribution and there's an ordinary quantum field theory entropy 
contribution. The, the basic idea is that although even though we're just calculating the entropy of the radiation, uh, we in this formula, we also include the black hole interior in the calculation of the entropy. This is the proposal. If you take this formula and um, you find the island through an extremization procedure, you find the island and at late times, what you find is that the island is the entire interior. You calculate this um, radiation from the formula, it simply gives the, the, the area term. This other term, the quantum field theory term drops out. So uh, the radiation entropy at late times is exactly the black hole entropy. And that goes to zero as the black hole evaporates. So the uh, entropy, if you believe this formula, the radiation entropy is consistent with unitary evaporation. It's going to zero just as it should, as it should when the radiation uh, is is the entire system, it should be in a pure state. This is a, a, this is a proposal for the entropy, but it actually goes further than that. Uh, this isn't just a formula for the entropy. There's an interpretation that goes along with it, which really uh, tells us how to think about the black hole interior. The interpretation is that um, when this island appears at late times, the island region is actually encoded in the Hawking radiation in the sense of a holographic duality. Now, this is not an ordinary holographic duality like ADS-CFT because it does not include any reduction in the space -time, number of space-time dimensions. If this is a four-dimensional black hole, then uh, the radiation is a four-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, so there's no reduction in the space-time space dimension, but it's holographic in the sense that the quantum state of a gravitational region, the black hole, is encoded in the uh, density matrix or wave function uh, of a non-gravitating system, or in this case, uh, a system where gravity is not important, just the quantum fields far away from the black hole. So in that sense, it's like a holographic duality. Uh, this encoding uh, is not understood very well. It's a very, it has to be very complex, um, but um, people are trying to understand it better. What I mean by encoding is, uh, is a very surprising fact that, for example, a field operator inside the island, like phi of x for some point in the island, uh, well that, that operator is, is actually a very complicated operator in the radiation. You can act with that operator and, and create stuff inside the black hole and manipulate things inside the black hole. So this is a very subtle uh, sort of violation of locality uh, in, in, in gravity due to non-perturbative effects. Okay, so that's the background uh, along the lines of what we also heard about from Rob. But what I wanna turn to now is uh, the origin of this of these ideas and of this formula directly from the gravitational path integral? So we're going to analyze this using the replica method. Our goal is just to calculate the entropy of the radiation using the gravitational path integral. We're going to do this in the low energy theory and uh, see what happens. We're gonna do this using the replica method. The, the replica method is as follows. We wanna calculate minus trace of rho log rho, but these logs are difficult to calculate directly using a path integral. Uh, so what the, method, the replica method does is to replace these by uh, powers. So we calculate uh, this object, the replica partition function, which is trace of rho to the n for integer n now, under favorable conditions on the complex n plane, if those are satisfied, uh, you can analytically continue in n away from the integers. Uh, and if you can do that analytic continuation, then you can calculate the fine grain entropy, the von Neumann entropy, uh, by taking the derivative as n goes to one. 
simply because this row to the one plus epsilon uh, becomes a log. Okay, so this is the idea of the replica method. And uh, what we need to do then is to calculate these replica partition functions using the gravitational path integral. I'll first sketch the basic idea in pictures, and then I'll give something closer to the actual calculation. The basic idea is that when you consider multiple copies of the black hole, here's case n equals three. So this is a, we've replicated the system. These are fictitious extra copies. You should think of this as a, as a calculational trick in order to uh, calculate the von Neumann entropy. These are not real, real black holes, they're just a, a trick that we've introduced to calculate this replica partition function. Uh, but the basic idea is that when you have multiple copies of the black hole and you calculate the gravitational path integral, wormholes can appear connecting the black hole interior, the black hole interiors. So in this case, we have three copies of the black hole living in three separate universes, but there are contributions to the gravitational path integral where those universes are connected through the interiors. Okay, so the basic idea is that in the replica method, dynamical wormholes appear connecting the black hole interiors. These are complex saddles, similar to instantons, that we can construct by explicit solution of the equations of motion for gravity plus matter in certain simple cases, including the case needed for the page curve. In the replica limit, which is this limit n to one, where you calculate the entanglement entropy, these saddles go away. As you take n to one, you now just have one copy of the black hole, the physical black hole, and there is no wormhole in the physical black hole. However, uh, the existence of these saddles away from n equals one leaves an imprint on certain observables, including the von Neumann entropy, because the von Neumann entropy is sensitive to the partition function at one plus epsilon. So th the existence of these wormholes for multiple copies will tell us something about the statistics of the density matrix at n equals one. That's our goal here. So now let me uh, go through this calculation in a bit more, um, in a, a, a bit more realistic of a way. So we wanna calculate these replica partition functions and we'll do that using a gravitational path integral so recall the path integral calculation of a transition amplitude. If we wanna calculate a, a, Euclid, a Euclidean transi transition amplitude, then uh, we put a boundary condition N on one end of Euclidean space-time and a different boundary condition on the other end of Euclidean space-time. You can think of this as, for example, what's done in the standard treatment of instantons in gauge theory. In gravity, we're interested in thermal states because we're interested in black holes. Uh, so uh, we're gonna um, do something a little bit different and calculate a thermal trace. So let's do that calculation. We wanna calculate an N equals one replica. So this is the simple case, this is the simplest case. We need to consider all integer N. So we'll start with N equals one. Uh, the N equals one replica is uh, just calculating trace of row. The difference from the gauge theory instanton type calculation is that we're now calculating a trace. And when you calculate a trace, the corresponding Euclidean path integral has a thermal circle. So this is the thermal circle corresponding to the trace. Um, and uh, it's well known that the, the um, Complex, the Euclidean saddle point that calculates this trace of rho is the Euclidean black hole, which has the shape of a cigar. The black hole region is here. The Euclidean horizon is, is all the way at the tip. Um, and this is the asymptotic region. Now, it's, I need to emphasize how, this, how we should think about this calculation when we, when we calculate this contribution to the path integral. We should think about this calculation as um, we first, as follows, we first impose some boundary conditions at infinity on the gravitational path integral. In this case, the boundary conditions are, we specify that there is a circle of size beta um, in the asymptotic region. And 
then it's up to the gravitational path integral to fill in the rest of the geometry. This is not something unlike in quantum field theory, where we specify the geometry and do the path integral on the geometry. In this case, uh, we specify the boundary conditions and we sum over geometries and the saddle points will be the, the solutions of the gravitational equations. Uh, but it's up, to, it's up to those gravitational equations to fill in this uh, part of the geometry here. Now let's go to the case of n equals two, which is where the first uh, really interesting um, effect occurs. So uh, now we're calculating the replica partition function trace of rho squared. And we need to do that by a gravitational path integral. Well, first we have to say what our boundary conditions are. The boundary conditions for trace of rho squared are um, that we have two circles of size beta. So this is what I'm drawing here is a boundary condition. It says we have uh, one circle for the first copy of rho. We have a second circle for the second copy of rho. Uh, now, I, there's also uh, the, other, the other things drawn here, I won't go into in much detail, but these are here because there's a matrix multiplication involved. Rho sub R is a matrix and we're doing a matrix multiplication, two copies. And what that does is it glues together these two boundary conditions along region R. And that's what these, uh, that's what these dotted lines represent. Okay, so that's our boundary condition. And now we're supposed to do the path integral and find the contributions with that boundary condition. Well, there's one obvious contribution to that path integral. It's just two copies of the Euclidean black hole. This I call the Hawking saddle because if you calculate the replica partition functions using this obvious solution, this obvious instanton uh, and then use this to calculate the entropy, you'll end up with Hawking's prediction for the entropy of the radiation and it will violate unitarity. The crucial fact is that there are other higher topology contributions to the gravitational path integral. Uh, so the, the next simplest one is what I've drawn here. So this is a, this is a Euclidean instanton where uh, instead of having just two copies of the Euclidean black hole, they're joined through the black hole interior. If we use these in a saddle point approximation to the gravitational path integral, then we'll get a contribution from each. There will be a, a contribution from the Hawking saddle, plus a contribution from the wormhole saddle, possibly plus more contributions. Now, the, the uh, important thing is the following. This Hawking saddle uh, is, is a measure, you can think of this, the action of this Hawking saddle as a measure of entanglement. It actually is precisely a measure called the second Rennie entropy. Uh, and what that means is that this quantity here, this e to the, I can't highlight it, this e to the, this S2 here, this is large, when the radiation is highly entangled with the black hole interior. So this contribution of the Hawking saddle to the gravitational path integral is exponentially suppressed when there's large entanglement of radiation with interior. And that's exactly the kind of situation where you run into problems with the information paradox. This wormhole contribution, well, we need to check that there's a saddle. There, there, that can be checked and there is a saddle. Uh, it's suppressed because they're gravitational, because they, it's suppressed simply by the gravitational action uh, that's, that's um, larger in, in the wormhole case. Um, so this is very suppressed, but it turns out that in situations like the information paradox, uh, this wormhole contribution is constant or, or actually growing in time. So it's very small, but constant or growing. Whereas the Hawking contribution is uh, being suppressed as e to the minus t, t is time. So um, when the radiation becomes large, the Hawking saddle uh, 
is too small to contribute, the wormhole saddle takes over. Okay, uh, as I said, we really need to be able to do these calculations for any value of the replica number, and that can be done, and I won't go into it, but that can be done at any n, and even can be done for non-integer n, and analytically continued in n. From there, we can calculate the von Neumann entropy by the replica formula minus c prime of one, and the result is the island formula for the radiation entropy. So this is a direct derivation of the island formula from the gravitational path integral that used nothing but the ordinary Euclidean methods. Uh, the crucial difference from earlier calculations is including these higher topology saddle points in the gravitational path integral. But really we've just followed the usual rules of the Euclidean path integral where you specify the boundary conditions and then you include the saddle points with those boundary conditions. If we look back at the page curve, then uh, in terms of these wormholes, the point is that at early times, this piece of the curve, the Hawking saddle dominates the path integral. At late times, uh, that saddle is suppressed by entanglement and the wormhole saddle dominates the path integral. Okay, so I'm um, running out of time. Let me just conclude with a couple of remarks. First of all, does this show that black hole evaporation is unitary? No, it does not, uh, but it's evidence in this direction. This is a calculation of the entropy that gives a unitary answer, um, but what is it missing? Well, we calculated this density matrix, um, sorry, this, this von Neumann entropy minus trace of rho log rho, uh, but we did it using the Euclidean path integral. And when we use the Euclidean path integral, we end up calculating rho sub r without, sorry, the, the entropy of rho sub r without ever calculating rho sub r itself. We've not calculated this matrix. Uh, we haven't even shown that such a matrix exists. That's really a question for the UV completion. And uh, the detailed matrix elements of rho sub r uh, will depend on the UV completion what string theory it is or, or um, some other theory. So that information is simply not included in the low energy effective description. What's, what's surprising is that its entropy is included in the low energy description. So that's, that's the new surprise. This is on the same footing as the Euclidean calculation of the black hole entropy by Gibbons and Hawking. They calculated the uh, black hole entropy from a Euclidean path integral. And they gave, they found the answer area over four, which we believe gives the right answer, but does not exhibit the microstates of the UV theory. That becomes a further consistency check that, that relies on, on going to the UV. So it's, it's quite similar um, to that. This raises, uh, I think, as many questions as it answers uh, I'll just mention two of them. Uh, one is whether we need to rethink problems in quantum cosmology. Cosmology also has horizons, it has large entropy. Uh, does it have islands? Do they affect how we think about cosmology in the early universe? Uh, maybe there's been work on this, but the interpretation so far is unclear. So I think that's still an open question. Another question it raises is do wormholes violate quantum mechanics? This is suggested by old work of Coleman and Giddings and Strominger and has been revisited recently. There are other situations where including wormholes seems to violate some basic properties of quantum mechanics. The reason for that is straightforward. It's just because quantum mechanics has, allows you to insert a complete set of states. And uh, that implies all sorts of uh, factorization type equalities. But when you start including wormholes or handles in your Euclidean space-time, um, that gives new contributions. Um, that gives new contributions that aren't captured by the standard uh, complete set of states. So you have to somehow understand how to enlarge the Hilbert space, or how to deal with this. Uh, so this is um, this is something that people are really still exploring and, and hasn't been understood in great detail yet. And I'll end there. So let me just conclude. 
The summary is that the ordinary rules of the Euclidean path interval can be used to calculate the entropy of the Hawking radiation. The result agrees with unitarity and quantitatively matches the earlier expectation uh, based on unitarity, but it also highlights the remaining puzzles of how to interpret the gravitational path integral. These issues of quantum cosmology, uh, wormholes and factorization problems, uh, and uh, more generally trying to understand exactly what the gravitational path integral is telling us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Please, questions. Can I ask you some naive question? Okay, for those people who love this page type, imagine that you have black hole with the mass 10, 15 gram, which you just formed. The other black hole with the mass 10, 15 gram, which appeared as a result of evaporation of much larger black hole. Third black hole, even larger black hole. Now, at the given moment of time, when you have mass 10, 15 gram, you claim that all these three black holes producing different radiation. Sorry, I didn't, did, I, did, I don't know if I followed that. You have how many uh, black holes? Uh, three black holes. Yes. Mass 10, 15 gram. One black hole you formed just with this mass. The other two you got as a result of evaporation of larger black holes, much larger black holes. Now, at the given moment of time, these three black holes, they have the same mass, precise. Now, if you trust in Hawking in page type, does it mean that radiation from these three black holes, when they have the same gram, the same masses, is different? No. No, what I don't think... No, if you had large black hole, then it had page time. Then it start to emit entropy, yeah? So Hawking radiation should be cross-correlated at the final stage of well, the evaporation. It, it, what it's correlated with is the early radiation. Okay, so, so if, you're an, if you're an observer who, has, who started with a large black hole and you've collected the early radiation, then you'll see correlations with the late radiation. But wait a minute, but then let's forget about previous stage, okay? The question, which this black hole, which you got as a result of the black hole, one solar mass, will be emitting radiation, which will be leading to the growing of the entropy? No, not alone. Not, not if you have access only to that radiation. No, sorry, this, I don't care is... about access, okay? I just forgot about everything what was in past. And then the entropy will not, will not shrink. And I am investigating all the radiation since the moment when black hole got mass 10, 15 gram. Now, okay. The curve what will grow. It will grow from the yes. mass 10, 15 gram? Yes. In all three cases. All three cases. Then tell me, okay, if you take this thing, then for the mass 10, 15 grams, there is also its own page type. So if you are considering then black hole, which is evaporating, that at each moment for this black hole, there is its own page time or what? Uh, well, the, did, the, you, did you trace my question? Yeah, the, the page time is is not a property of the black hole. It's a it's a property of the of the radiation. It's a property of the density it, matrix of the of the radiation. Sorry, it, depends, it, depend, it depends on the mass, as we know very well, right? Um, on which mass? On the initial mass when you formed black hole, or on the current mass when you forgot about previous history? What is this? Let me give an analogy. If we have if we have a bell pair. No, 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 I don't want bell pairs, okay? So this is the analogy I I'm going to give. No, I we want to know about page time. Page time is determined by the original mass of the black hole or at each moment of time when I got the black hole with the given mass, it has its own page time. Do you understand my the, question? The page time is, is, cannot be assigned to a black hole. It's a property of the radiation. 
Sorry, okay, maybe the property of radiation, but I want to consider only radiation which was emitted when black hole, which were formed in a different ways, yeah, got the same mass, irrespective of their previous history. I'm going to give the qubit example because this is the, the closest okay. explanation. Okay, you can give me a qubit so, example, but okay, it doesn't uh, explain me well, you, you, what it, it doesn't. Is. If, if you don't like it, you don't like it, but I'm going to give this example. So we have, we have two entangled qubits. And this is like, the, if, I, if I look at only one of them, this is like asking whether it's in a pure state or not. Well, if you have, the, if you have only one of them, it's in a mixed state. We can calculate its entropy, it's log two. Uh, and the question of whether it's in a pure state is, is a question of whether we have access to the second qubit. And exactly the same is true of the Hawking radiation. Very good. But if you want to resolve information paradox, okay, if you start with the black hole, doesn't matter how it was formed, okay, when you start with 10, 15 gram, it has- So it does matter. It has, it has after that at the end, to emit all the entropy or all the radiation or all the correlations. It doesn't no. matter what you No, it does. no, no Sorry. Because... okay. Yeah. For me, there is no problem, by the way, with the fact that entropy is growing because, okay, some entropy could be hidden inside the hole. Okay, if, for instance, it has a remnant. But the question is the following. Since which moment of time Okay, this kind of radiation which the black hole emits start to bring us back information. No, there's a difference. There's a difference, which is the, the black hole, the 15 gram black hole that uh, started out as a large black hole is not in a pure state. And the 15 so, gram black hole so that now you claim, now is in a pure state. Now you claim that the black hole 10 15 mass 10 15 gram which was obtained from larger black hole and black hole which you formed as 10 15 gram they are different because one is not in pure state and the other is in pure state okay? yes so it means that mass 10 15 gram but roughly speaking there should be extra characteristic of this black hole which would tell you you got it as a result of a previous evaporation or you got it just right now, straight. Yes. Right? yes. So it means that the black holes with the same mass should have extra hairs. I'm sorry. Only in, the, only in the UV complete theory. You don't have to be able to see that in the low energy theory. Ah, uh, okay. You see, I know my black hole and normally I didn't care about past, but when you can see the page times, then it looks like your theory with Hawking evaporation becomes strongly non-local in a sense that the current state, which you consider depends on the previous history. Yes, that's certainly true. Yes. Okay. So black hole has an infinite amount of hairs, which we do not know how to characterize. Uh, no, it's, no, it's not infinite. infinite. Huh? It's it's not infinite. The the black hole. No, I can get black hole from the mass which is ten billion masses. Okay, as a result of Hawking evaporation, in principle. But the, the 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 entanglement, the amount of information in the entanglement with its earlier radiation, is at most the coarse grain entropy of the black hole itself. So that's the amount of hair that it has. It has. It doesn't have an infinite amount. Okay, but information should be finally released according to those who speaks about information paradox, right? Yes. So it should be somewhere in the trace, in the cross correlation of the quanta, which people call Hawking quanta, correct? Yes. So now, depending which black hole I have with the same mass, depending on its history, this cross correlation should be different since black hole got mass 10, 15 gram or not. Sorry, what should be different? The cross correlation, the amount of information which you are bringing when the mass of the black hole dropped to 10, 15 gram. Yeah, yeah, sure. that should be, that will <laughs> depend on the, on the microstate, yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. I got your answer.
If you got my question, I think I understood your answer. Okay, thank you. So, other questions, please. We still have five minutes. So, Wei, thank Shao, yeah, please. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, so, thank you for this nice talk. Um, so, can you please go back to the n equals two replica case calculation, please? Yeah, here. So, so can I? May I just ask? Um, will the higher, higher, high topology term, higher topology terms that you represent by the dot dot dot, will they also be uh, dominant at late times? Good. Um, the answer is that we don't know. Uh, some of them we know how to include. The ones we know how to include are the ones that are replica symmetric. Uh, the ones that have a, a cyclic symmetry permuting, permuting the replicas, those we understand. Now, there could also be non-replica symmetric uh, contributions. We don't know how big they are, but as far as the entropy, it, it, it doesn't matter because if, if the bigger terms are, are if, if these dot dot dots are even bigger, then the entropy will be even smaller and there'll be even less of an information paradox. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay, any other questions, please? Yes. Yeah, Andre, you are muted first of all. So look. Uh, uh, oh, no, please, Andre, if you want to ask, please ask. But he has to unmute himself first. Uh, oh, no, I'm not unmuted. Uh, I, I think you, you, uh, you hear me. Now we hear you, but before we didn't hear you. We... Apparently somebody else uh, unmuted me. Anyway, the technical question regarding this n equal to uh, replica pictures, replicas picture. Uh, this very strange uh, type of gluing together these replicas. You see these cuts on your uh, slide. Uh, they extend up to the point of uh, what is this uh, dotted dotted circle. Uh, it would seem that this um, gluing of these replicas should continue even further uh, into this area where you have this non-trivial topological wormhole bridge. Um, no, so so this the the reason for this, if if we were calculating the um, thermal density matrix of the full system, then that's what would happen: is this cut would go all the way into the all the way into here. But here, the, the cut is region R. It's the radiation region whose entropy we're calculating. But then yeah. the ambiguity in the definition of this dotted circle, what, what is this position of this circle? Uh, how yeah, so we're making an approximation here, which is that we're ignoring gravity at some, above, uh, at, at some distance from the black hole. So we need to be able to specify the geometry. Say 100 Schwarzschild, we go 100 Schwarzschild radii away from the black hole. And there we ignore the large effects of gravity. And we assume that we can specify the, the, the cut there. So that's how this calculation is being done. And, the, and you should think of this dotted line as being an artificial cutoff 100 Schwarzschild radii away from the black hole. Uh, that hasn't been fully justified. In particular, we don't know how to include the, the effects of, of gravitons at, the, at this cutoff point. There are subtleties in, in defining in, de, in, in singular contributions to the path integral coming from this cutoff point from gravitons. And uh, we've neglected those. We think that they're small, uh, but there's some technical issues that, that haven't been um, straightened out there. So the ambiguity in this parameter, what is it? This is just uh, within the uh, field theory expansion or it actually goes beyond it? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by the field theory expansion? Well, I mean, I mean you have low energy, low energy approximation. And so it's effective field theory. It's not, it's not. Uh, uh, even, even, the, even in the effective theory, uh, 
we don't know how to include the graviton contributions that come from the tip from the very end point of this region. Uh, so the, the red region here, this is the region where the cut in the, this is, this red region is the region whose entropy we're calculating. And this corresponds to the cut on that Euclidean picture. Mm -hmm. There are contributions from the gravitons themselves from, from this end point that we don't know how to include even in the low energy theory, uh, but we don't think are important. So, so that the result becomes parametrically depending on the choice of this point, you know, this cutoff, yeah? Yes, it depends on this point, as it should, uh, because when we, when we calculate the page, term, page curve as a function of time, what we do is we extend this point uh, up into the future um, so that the calculation as a function of time is a calculation as you move this endpoint up into the future of the black hole. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if it's finished, then the last question, which we have right by Luca, please. Yes, yeah, we'll try to be quick. So uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a question. So basically, Okay, let's uh, assume the whole derivation of the formula from the Pathinder. And uh, you manage to uh, basically compute the trace of the density matrix without knowing, of course, the density matrix because basically you don't know the final state of your uh, black hole evaporation because you would need a full theory of quantum gravity in that case. But my question is basically for sure what you notice with this computation is that the final uh, state of the radiation purifies. So basically in the end, you will have a pure state for the radiation. Okay, and this is consistent with the final state for the black hole where we have just a regular space time. So where we have nothing left. Okay, but how do you know, for instance, let's suppose that we don't know how the final state would be, could be a remnant. If it's a remnant, you will still have a final state where the, uh, the, the entropy of the radiation is not pure at the end because it could be entangled with, I mean, it could be the full state black hole radiation, which is pure, but along the two states are not pure. So how do you know? I mean, it seems that anyway, you are, your result is consistent only with one possible final state of your uh, final evaporation. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. We're calculating the, the entropy only of the radiation. Yes. So, so yes, there's simply no five. need, there's simply no need for any remnant because the radiation is, oh, sure, is, indeed. is you're already pure. But... You're showing that it purifies, right? Yeah. But the, the state of the radiation is pure. Yeah. But this is not all, I mean, this is not the only possible final state for the black hole coupled to the radiation, right? Because you could have a remnant, which is a still some correlation with your radiation. And in that case, this computation will just tell you that it is wrong, the result, because it should not purify. Well, this calculation is evidence that there is no remnant. Yeah, but so you see, so you're saying something about the final state where your effective theory should not apply, right? Well, the effective theory, you're right that there's an, there's an issue right here at the, at the end point. So yeah. the effective theory calculation is, is valid everywhere until here. Um, I mean to be not quite at the end point. Um, now, when you, so there's already a paradox here. And, and by the time you, you get down here, you've, um, you, you know that the entropy of the radiation is very small. Now it's true that right at this last moment, the effective theory calculation, the effective theory breaks down. The reason for that is that the island approaches the singularity. Okay, so at this very end point, the calculation breaks down, but at that point, the entropy of the radiation is already um, only Planck scale. It, so the remnant cannot have more than, uh, cannot have more entropy than, than the Planck scale. It could be that there's a Planck scale remnant that you can't see in this effective theory. Mm 